thanks so much for uh, joining us on the show today, Josh. Um, I really appreciate you, you you coming on and and spending an hour or so with us. Um, can we maybe just get started by like, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and and sort of your background and and what you've done and where where it's led you to be? Yeah, sure. And uh, thanks for having me. Um, so I'm an independent digital learning strategist. Um, and what that means is I've spent the better part of a decade just helping organizations go digital the right way, um, whether that's building their digital learning strategy from the ground up or fine tuning it or building great digital learning experiences, uh, just helping them create amazing things. Um, previously, I was the head of digital learning experience at a large professional services firm. And prior to that, I was head of the solutions design team for a, sort of a creative digital learning agency. So whether it's leading LXD teams or supporting the C-suite, I've kind of seen a little bit of it all in the corporate L&D world. Um, I also teach at the University of Toronto. Uh, oh, I teach a certificate program on learning experience design. And lately, I've been producing a fun audio series called Digital Learning Done Right, which is for digital learning leaders to help fine tune their learning strategies. So anything at the intersection of design or story or learning or technology, that's probably where you'll find me. Ah, okay. Amazing. Oh, that's awesome. It's it's so cool to hear that you're um you're out teaching sort of on the ground as well. Um, I think that's something that's probably sorely lacking from a lot of universities having sort of industry experience in in their actual degrees and 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 working um with people in the industry. Yeah, you know, you know what? It's I, I will say it's it's hard sometimes to hold on to it because obviously you're balancing it on the side. But uh, yeah, I, I think my colleague was reminding me I've been doing it for about seven years now, which is kind of crazy. Uh, but I love it. I love doing it. I love. Uh, not only having great communities of practice with people that are in the industry, but also obviously uh, helping that next generation of learning designer with the right mindset and and uh, skills to succeed. So, oh, that, yeah, that's amazing. That's awesome. That's a long time. That's 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 amazing. Yeah, I have a lot of students come and go and 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 go and onto onto bigger and, and new things and all of those kinds of kinds of stuff. That's that's really cool. Um, if you had to like boil it down, like one one sort of key lesson that you would sort of distill from from your experience in the learning industry what would it what would it be it's probably a pretty tricky question to <laughs> to to boil down but um is there is that what, what how would you how would you go about that well i mean i think that's part of the inspiration for why i, I call the the audio series digital learning done right is because it's pretty easy to do it wrong <laughs> uh, uh, in the field out there. And I think it's, you know, learning technology is a bit of a misnomer. And I find that, uh, and at least in, in the partnerships that I've had over the years, the ones that actually worked the best were when we actually didn't talk about technology at all. And we started with really simple questions um, and really simple, but powerful and complex questions. And we use technology as sort of one of the you know pieces in our tool belt as opposed to just leading with it and if i were to say you know what's the one key piece coming from the digital learning world is just don't lead with the technology i know it sounds a bit counterintuitive but it's true it's uh you tend to get very caught up in features and uh you know uh um, being uh, aligned to this standard or that standard or what functionality you can do and you just get caught up in that world so don't leave with the technology yeah, that's a great that's a great summary. I think um, you're probably the first person to to go straight onto that that sort of path of, of tech. And how, how important do you see tech in the learning ecosystem? You know, um, obviously, world's changing. There's all, all sorts of awesome tools, but that's kind of like a double edged sword at sometimes because it can be a bit overwhelming and there's so many choices and and you can like <clears throat> go down <clears throat> go down that path right where you're you're sort of delving into giant spreadsheets of feature sets and things like that rather than actually producing what matters uh, at the end of the day so how, how do you see learning in, in the uh, sorry technology in the learning ecosystem yeah I mean it's it's hard to not you know embrace it to a certain degree I mean you have to right um, and I think the, the pressure on on our world um, in HR in l d is I feel like it was just kind of like thrust upon us and you certainly when you think about like the early days of e-learning and the authoring tools and the slideware and the quick conversion of textbooks and classroom teaching into whatever it is that we call e-learning now you can see there's this huge gap of of, dig of digitization and i always like to make the difference between digitization and digitalization yeah. and just that's the difference of approach to how you want to get it done and using technology there's so much amazing sophisticated uh, consumer grade technology experiences out there. 
And I think the, the thing that's just always really important to think about is just what's the most meaningful use of it. And I, and I think that's something that we don't pause enough to really ask. Uh, whenever we're thinking of going digital, um, there's always sort of the usual suspects, right? We do it for scale. We do it for efficiency. Uh, sometimes we do it for speed. Sometimes we do it for cost. Um, but I'm a big advocate, actually, of something I call the digital advantage. And that's something that we don't really talk too much about when we're saying, hey, I want to do e-learning or, or use ed tech in a certain way, because we're so certainly as you know, senior leaders, we're so caught up in, well, we need to scale this to 10,000 people. Well, it needs to be digital because we can't do workshops all around the world, whatever that may be. And we kind of reduce the technology to this sort of very rudimentary form of like scale, reach, speed and stuff. But there's so much more that the technology can offer. Uh, and that's really what I'm an advocate of, of is like, let, when we design with a digital mindset, things like data, things like storytelling in new forms and new media forms, uh, things like accessibility, which is so prominent these days. These yeah. are all things that digital can do in a way that the in-person experience simply can't. And it's, and it's not to contrast one or the other or say one is better than the other. I'm definitely not of that camp, but it's more of we're not using digital in the ways that we can to really augment the learning experience. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> There's pros and cons to both, right? <clears throat> when you're when you've got yeah. some tech, you, you can log and record things um, on, on say a data front um, that you might not be able to, to sort of benefit from in the room. And, and there's, there's definitely a benefit to being in the room. I think everybody after COVID probably learned that and, and, and sort of missed, missed uh, human interaction a little bit. Um, I guess on that note, how important do you see data being in, in that sort of L and D and that technology world? Yeah. I mean, th this is just such an underserved part of what we're trying to do, you know, and, Sometimes I think we, we tend to forget um, why LLB exists, you know, as, as a function within organizations. I think we just kind of get caught up in the stuff, creating the stuff, administering the stuff, registering the stuff, executing the stuff, you know, and, and we don't take a step back and be like, well, we're actually here to help solve business problems, uh, organizational challenges, seize opportunities, help people be at their best. Um, and I, f I find that, you know, as L&D professionals, we also tend to be a little intimidated by data because uh, it is it is a big term and, you know, it does need specialist expertise to a certain degree. But I prefer to kind of just rather than say data, I just like to say insights and information. And as learning designers, as learning strategists, we all have things that we are interested in and want to know. What, even, you know, not to go as far high up as, okay, what are the business problems that we're trying to solve and what's the role of learning in it, but even bring it down to the efficacy of your own programs. You know, is this, if I do this, is that right? Is that what people are looking for or not? Data is just simply a conversation to help us do that. It's a conversation between us and our learners to learn more about them so that we can help them a bit more. And, you know, to take it to a, a further step uh, bigger than that is to even say, well, what if we gave that data to our learners themselves? You know, what if we put them in the driver's seat and say, hey, here are the metrics. And, you know, in, in certain fields, you know, sales is a really great example of it, or, you know, specific product training, there's very specific data points that govern the role and business performance. Yeah. Absolutely. And so depending on who your audience is, they've already got a keen sense of like, okay, this is the data I need to go. How do I help impact that metric and how do I need to get there? Right. And so some are better at talking in terms of data and getting used to it in data. But I find that we're a little afraid on the L&D side to really approach data. Um, and I don't mean completion. That's not a data point. Well, it is, <laughs> but not in isolation. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, to, to really start having conversations about, well, you know what, what if we took that two-week training and rather than have it be, you know, three to four, two-hour sessions, maybe we did it in 10-minute chunks every other day. What would happen? Well, we need the data to know what would happen if, if that were to happen. So it's it's something where you really need to take the plunge as an organization um, and becoming more data-driven, more data set, more data-centric, I would say as well, too. So putting data at the heart of your learning strategy and not something as opposed to like, oh, well, we'll measure something if we have time at the end. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think when you you do take that approach, right, it's hard because you don't have that benchmark now. And and what does that measurement mean? And and how how do you actually start to use it? Um, you, you mentioned sort of making that the heart of your your L and D strategy. H how do you find um, L and D strategy typically aligns with business strategy? Uh, is that is that something that you you see sort of L and D professionals have have a bit of trouble with, or something that you've seen done really well anywhere? 
Yeah, you know, it's, I, I got to say, it's getting better. It's getting a lot better. And I think that um, business leaders are starting to look to L&D as really a catalyst for change and for solutions, which is really great. And I think vice versa, I think L&D leaders are also saying, hey, if I don't speak to the business and if I don't show up to that business table, we need to justify more and more of why even we exist and what we're trying Absolutely. to do. And so in, in, the, in the organizations that I've partnered with, the ones that have the most nuanced sense of how their strategy is executed are the ones that really succeed in the L&D sphere. The ones that show up with that RFP of like, we're not looking for a tech vendor or a, you know, a content solution. What we're actually looking for is to solve this business challenge. How do you think we can solve this business challenge? And really starting there and also having sort of this green pastures look at it as well too, because you know, as we know, we love training, we love L&D, but sometimes training might not even be the answer, right? And, and having an honest conversation about that as well too. And so the, the ones that I find to succeed the most are the ones that can quickly grab the different parts of the business that are relevant and, and can also enable certain things within their organization as well too. I think that's important. Those are the ones that succeed a lot and constantly do that kind of internal networking within their, within their own um, organizations, certainly large uh, complex organizations. Yeah. Those are the ones um, that really succeed. Or, you know, if you've been on the client side, such as I have for most of my career, you're doing that work up front to be like, oh, you haven't spoken to that department yet? Let's have a conversation. And maybe you're facilitating that conversation to extract those metrics um, about why we're here and what are we trying to do. Um, that's where the data-driven conversations begin before we jump quickly to the solution. Yeah, absolutely. I, I completely agree with with sort of having having a bit of a nuanced strategy and being part of that table. Because really, I, I think anyway, the business strategy should be, you know, it's part of the learning strategy, right? <clears throat> Is we're trying to improve performance, change some behaviors, whatever it might be, uh, to get an outcome and and that's really what we're trying to do from a, from a business perspective, I guess, all of the time. Um, yeah, and 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 L and D is just one of the levers within an organization, right? Um, in the same way, a business can't expect L and D to solve all their challenges. L and D also shouldn't presume that it's there to solve all the business challenges, or that training, you know, in a certain way can. I mean, uh, to give you one example, we once went through uh, quite a long client journey. Uh, and, you know, of course, on, on the vendor side, you're trying to secure business and get a win, but uh, it ended up being a much better, healthier customer relationship. We went through this almost three, six month process, just trying to understand the challenge and what we're trying to do. And by the end of it, we actually both realized that, huh, maybe building this one hour of content isn't the right thing for us right now and what we're trying to do, which is obviously tough from us in terms of kind of just walking away from, from certain business, but it could have been just easy for us to take that and say, let's build this one hour course, whatever that may be, and let's hope that something sticks or hope that it's going to yeah. impact it. But rather, it kind of turned into a totally different direction. We went more strategic. We built out a strategy around trying to solve it, and it ended up being much more along the lines of targeted job aids that was far less use of the client's budget, but a much more efficient one that ended up being much more impactful than trying to go through this big, long, broad learning, which they thought that they needed or wanted. So another great reason to have these conversations early and also to have them in a meaningful way is that it actually helps maximize the efficiency of your budgets. Um, so you can put it towards more meaningful things down the road. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that you know, when, you, when you're really solving those problems, you, you're going to get those results, right? As opposed to <clears throat> throwing it and, yep, yeah, let's hope it sticks or let's build a module and that's the outcome. It's like, well, well why, why are we doing it? What, what are some of the challenges yeah. that you see? Uh, like, like some of the things that you, you, you've seen that are tricky when you're putting together that sort of um, that process and designing those activities? Well, I, I, think, I think it's a matter of kind of getting out of rivers of thinking, right? We, uh, the... We're in such an interesting field because everyone has learned something at some point in their life, right? Yeah. Learning is ubiquitous. And we bring this prior experience with us, whether it's institutionalized in the classroom or the lecture hall, or whether it's from online training that, you know, you poor thing have probably taken at some point. You're like, okay, this is what it, this is what it, it can be and should be. And mm. a big part of, of my role over the years have actually been about just opening up eyes um, about, no, this is what's possible. And, you know, e-learning doesn't have to be boring and dry and, you know, uh, stuff that needs to, uh, you know, you know, pull your eyes out to get through, but rather it can be inviting and engaging and story-driven and immersive. Um, and so just really 
getting people on board, but starting by debunking what they think learning is and should be. Um, not that, you know, uh, I'm the definitive expert on it, but certainly just working with working with your key, sto- key stakeholders concept of learning, understanding where they're coming from and what they think learning is and can achieve, um, that can often be a stumbling point uh, depending uh, on which organization you're working with and also how imperative the uh, the project is because sometimes you've got like a great set of you know critical stakeholders and then in the last minute that key executive sponsor comes in and is like, well, <laughs> Why aren't we doing it like this? And it's like, you know, all, all the work that you've been working towards in the last three months is kind of shot, you know, to do it. So, you know, just never underestimate the amount of education you always need to have with your stakeholders uh, to, to help sort of broaden minds around it. Yeah, absolutely. I think everyone's been through that. Uh, you know, and executives come to the table and sort of said, "Hey, actually, we're, we're going to flip this and we're going to change the script and 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 we're going to go this this direction." And you're sort of like, "Oh no." <laughs> yeah, and I I often find it's it's helpful. Um, something that I do with clients is we kind of build this sort of manifesto at the very beginning, something that we can both align on and agree upon. Uh, and you know, in typical executive style, it, you try and organize it and reduce it down to a one slider. And just say, you know, well, so that anytime anyone comes into a project, you know, you can start with that one side and be like, hey, we've come across this journey. And these are the five things we believe this experience needs to be. And I use the word experience quite intentionally because it's not a course. It's not an e-learning. It's not a facilitated. It, it's purely an experience. And that already starts that semantic journey starts with, okay, this feels yeah. experiential as opposed to rote or whatever it is. Um, and, and also showing that you've worked with that team to achieve it. You know, that collaborative nature is super important. So that when that executive sponsor comes in, it's not about like, oh, well, what are you telling me what learning is? Oh, this, my team and you did this together. Okay. Well, now I'm starting to listen a bit more. So I find that's always super important to establish. And then you can go into describing the solution that you're, you're working towards. Yeah, absolutely. That I think, um, the under, the underestimation of how much education you, you should provide and, and spend on the, the actual team itself, I, I think is, is something that pops up a lot. And you mentioned that there's sort of, you might have like five experiences or so that you're, you're putting together there. How do you prioritize what to do within those experiences and, and sort of how they're made up and what activities they're created from? Yeah. I mean, uh, it, uh, kind of starts with what we've been talking about. It starts with the business priorities, right? It starts with, uh, uh, I'm a I'm a huge fan of quick and early wins. Um, I think we're constantly in the battle for not only getting our organizations and their leaders to get buy into new and interesting, exciting things that we're doing, but also our learners, right? And I, I think anytime we want to try and do something bold, which I'm a big fan of, by the way, <laughs> in front of our learners, uh, we also need to be careful about the energy and the time we extract in order to doing it. So for me, it's a balance of what's important to the business, but also what's going to have the biggest payoff to mm. getting that data, as we were talking about, to getting that data and bringing it back to our learners and the business and saying, hey, this worked or it didn't work. You know, that's the other part too, right? Is fail fast, learn fast, that sort of mentality. Um, so uh, obviously you want to go to where the business is most needing something, but you also want to go to where's the quickest place you can get data to learn. Yeah, absolutely. And and have you had much success sort of proving the the impact of that data and and sort of the the correlation or causation behind the outcomes that you've sort of produced there? And and how have you seen that done really well? Because I find that's something that people really struggle with within the L and D space. And I think it sort of goes back to you know that justifying to the senior executive or getting a business case out, and they find it quite difficult to to find those data points to to use to show some causation and correlation behind the impact of what they've actually developed. Yeah, no, this is a this is a great question, and th- this comes back to the whole data being quite an intimidating thing for organizations. And thing, I mean, we we all know it's hard to definitively isolate the effects of learning on yeah. performance, you know, either positive. Or the, we know that. And, you know, I think the easy thing to do is to just throw in the towel and be like, okay, well, let's go back to our completion rates. Right. But um, I, I, I tend to think of it in terms of a maturity curve and every organization is on a different maturity curve in terms of their relationship with data. Mm-hmm. I've worked with organizations that are really data savvy and they're ready to dive into the level three and four metrics and say, okay, we've got this. We've organized it on our side. Let's start talking about it. Oftentimes I find we can't even get 
uh, you know, organizations on board with that. The other side of it is, you know, people that are, yeah, you know, for, for better or worse saying, sorry, SCORM 1.2, that's all I kind of go with. We have some smiley sheet <laughs> stuff and that's it, you know, and, and you really need to take people where they are and organizations where they are. And rather than trying to, you know, pedal to the metal, go, okay, well, let's prove impact and correlation and let's go. Uh, I really think of it as just trying to move the needle. And depending on where the organization is and their relationship with data, specifically in L&D, my goal is to come and be like, okay, well, we're talking about these data points. What if we just took it two steps up? And let's not, let's not burden ourselves and put the pressure of like, okay, well, prove the impact of this, prove the impact of that. Of course, we all want to get there. But I think it's sort of a muscle you have to train and flex yes. to, to not only get better at it on the measurement side, of which technology has a role, and having the data and having the business organize itself around, okay, we care and prioritize these data points. Uh, but sort of nudging an organization forward and saying, hey, well, let's just focus perhaps on program improvement because we can control that a little bit more. So maybe all the data that we're trying to take in from our learners or from you know our pilots or anything like that is just tied to how can we make this better? What's working? What's not? Um, and that opens a door to learner preferences and learner, learner cadence. And now we can, in our next, and I, I like calling them data-driven experiments. It's like, and in our next experiment, then we can explore, okay, well, um, do you like videos better or do you like uh, courses better? Do you like PDFs better? Do you consume this outside of work? Do you can, if we gave you a device, would you do it or not? Now, of course, this is all tied to sort of preference and usability and activity, but then you're slowly getting the confidence, I think, as an organization to say, let's start targeting some of those business metrics, right? And it's like, okay, well, uh, if we know that if we can improve product knowledge around this, and we know that um, having X percent of uh, proficiency in this product knowledge will allow you to sell this better, let's do some A-B testing. Yep. Let's see those that take this particular experience, how they fare in terms of results in Q3 and 4 compared to those, you know? And so getting the confidence to speak that language um, and work your way up to it, I think is, 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 a, is a pragmatic strategy, if you ask me, rather than going to a client that's totally unafraid, certainly on the ed tech side of things, you know, as a vendor, it's like we can come in with this amazing tech set and features and be like, oh, well, we've got 30 dashboards and, you know, and you're going to love it. And, gonna, and it's for a lot of people, that's a lot, right? That's, that's, that's a lot to go through. And so starting with the simple questions, what are you trying to achieve and helping, helping your stakeholder form a concept in their mind, like, okay, we want to get there. What if we started with this step next? How would you feel about that? What would it look like? Is your team ready to maybe collect some of that stuff in a post? Because we do know that properly collecting things and measuring things, even outside of the realm of technology, does take time. You need to literally wait for some time to take place before you can say this had an impact on something or not. So just that commitment, keeping that momentum, uh, a huge part of it is tied to your confidence with how you want to work with data. So I'm, I'm really big on helping working with stakeholders to build their confidence in working with data. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I that that approach is is such a good way to go about it because data is such an overwhelming topic. We know data scientists, so it's super in demand, right? It's hard to get people to even understand yeah. it. Um, and I think if you dive too deep, that's when you can sort of, you know, you, you go off the deep end, right? And, and having a, a trained muscle approach, as, as you sort of said, is, is sort of, um, I think, a, a, good, a good way to build a base to su succeed. Uh, are there any sort of things that you've seen uh, like activities or exercises um, that have helped people build that confidence in managing that data uh, to, to get some of those quick and, and short, sharp wins that you mentioned earlier? Yeah, I, I, I really love this. And this is actually a great example of how we can use technology in certain ways. Um, uh, you know better than I do, you know, at a certain degree, when you've got a learning technology platform in front of you, it's a huge part of it will be reduced to what it's capable of. <laughs> and, you know, so many times I've spoken to, you know, to stakeholders and they'll have said, well, we've got, you know, this platform and this LXP and we're using this for social work with it, you know, and it's like, and make it work. And I think part of, um, you know, obviously I'm speaking from a very strong sort of client corporate bias, but this kind of applies to any sort of organization and how it works, but coming together as a team and saying, here's our tech landscape and here's the data points we can extract. I feel like enough, the teams don't do that enough of just sitting down and talking about what are we capable of doing and how do we use that in new and exciting ways? Mm. Because sometimes it's sort of left to this sort of transactional thing. 
oh, we need to deploy this training. It needs to go. And then maybe we'll look at the dashboards if we're free one day and I can remember my login credentials or something like that, right? <laughs> yeah. But rather starting at the very beginning and be like, oh, this, okay, so we can track a cohort journey by this capability level. What could we do with that? Um, and having, a, having a, a great conversation, whether it's your internal team or with your you know, technology partners to say, and the other thing too, you know, that uh, the, on the client side that we kind of keep as a little bit of a secret, don't be afraid to put your whole partners to work together, you know, to say, hey, you are my chosen technology partners. You guys figure it out, you know, and like come together <laughs> and, and they'll, they'll want to. There's obviously a vested interest in doing that, but just sort of putting it all together rather than looking at it in silos is, is a really important part of thinking about your data strategy uh, with technology. But finding a way to just kind of pick on one metric, that's the other part too about building the confidence. It's like pick one metric that you find interesting. Uh, not even about relevant or impactful that you find interesting that you can play with. Uh, I feel like we just don't do enough playing in, in our roles of what we're trying to do and say, is this going to work or is it not? And a really simple one is something that you can borrow from the marketing world where they just do subject line text, uh, testing, right? It's like, if I include an emoji in my subject line, will it get more open rates than not? Start super simple like that. Um, the one that I always love to do is to think about, you know, whether you're working with engineers or salespeople, um, you know, target audiences that are very much like, give it to me and let me run with it and let me go with it, right? It's like, well, how, if less is more with this group, how much is less? How less is less? Uh, and, and to a certain degree, what are they asking for? And is this the, is our relationship that you can find out through data, is our relationship mostly of like, you tell me what you need and I'll give it to you versus me thinking I know what you need or predicting what you need and then trying to figure out what to give it to you. So there's, there's lots of little different ways by just starting with simple questions and trying to see if you can find an answer to it and then going from there. Yeah, that's, that's a great, a great tip. And I, I really like what you, you said around the experimentation. I think that's something that does get lost quite a lot in L and D and it's, um, it's so integral. I know like executive teams, right? That's, they talk about that all the time. Okay. Let's run this little experiment. Um, we're going to see, you know, does it do well? Does it not do well? And we're going to AB test. And in marketing, as an example, you just refine and you refine. And it might be that for whatever reason, a smiley face at the end of that subject heading, uh, that, that doubles your open rate and you go, Oh, well, we stumbled across some gold. Um, so I think, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. And, and, and just, just to add to that, I think another part of what's, what's the best way to go about it also is to actually think about what the business is looking for in terms of, uh, um, and then that's often a question that, you know, when I'm working with the project at the beginning of the thing, I like to sort of do like a sort of a future state exercise with the team and say, okay, six months from now, we know we're going to sit down and this stakeholder is going to come in. It's going to be maybe the second time they see us this whole project. We're going to have five minutes with them. What are, what are they going to want to see? Mm. You know, and what's, what's, what's the data points that they are really top of mind for them these days? Is there a way we can approach that data point? So just kind of like, we're always just trying to buy into more of getting that organization aligned, thinking about next year's budget or wherever that may be. So whatever you can do to say everything we did here is in support of those one or two metrics that that leader looks to us for, uh, is just a really pragmatic way to, to make sure you're moving the right direction. Do you have a take a uh like a call create a persona of those different areas within the organization to sort of how do you how do you go about sort of categorizing or logging um and displaying to the LD team those different metrics that that might be important to different teams right because as you mentioned a sales team probably very very different to an engineering team but they've got a lot of overlap in the way they might want to learn yeah do you do you mean do you mean personas about the end user or personas of within the organization the different stakeholders within the organization yeah i guess the organization um because I, I think if you uh in, in a large org you can get pretty probably pretty granular and <laughs> it might be yeah. looking to do a persona for every single uh sort of end end user that's out there but um you know some people do do it and, and props to them you, you know what i i mean I've definitely worked with personas in terms of like your target group. And, you know, when you're, when you're building experiences for 10, 20, 30,000 people, you definitely need to start representing them in different ways. Right. But never really thought about that in terms of, you know, your own organization and certainly the key stakeholders within it. Um, what I certainly like to do, and this is maybe just my PTSD from you know, being burned a few <laughs> times, but I love to set up uh, my understanding of an org chart within a, within a yeah. project team. 
And, and I, and I ask sometimes some painfully obvious questions because I, because sometimes you'll be at the 11th hour of project and be like, oh, well, this person needed to weigh in much bigger than that person or mm -hmm. IT or legal, or, you know, needs to come in and, and do this. And so just setting up that sort of project management component of like, okay, here's who's who in the house. And uh, okay, so before this goes to this stage, this person needs to look at it. And what exactly are we asking of them when they do see it? And so, and, and certainly this also is beneficial for sort of the key sponsor on your side as well too, because maybe they haven't thought about it as well too, because from their standpoint, it's like, okay, well, this person just needs to be CC'd on this email. Yeah. And, you know, and, and then that might just be, you know, from their standpoint, but for that individual who is being on, it's like, no, I need to review every T and every I that needs to be done as well there. So that I find is a, a great exercise to just iron out all the things that, you know, need to be validated to, to bring something across the finish line. Yeah, that, that sounds like a fantastic approach. And I can see it being very useful for things like developing even like a budget or an art, uh, a business case to go and get training, right? Because you've got some of those different layers and maybe once you've built that, that sort of uh, old chart out, it's it's something that you could could use again and again and again as well to sort of understand how you could go forward with a lot of different things. Yeah, no, that's a great point too. And, and I'm, I'm thinking of a couple of stories now where, you know, you have these amazing conversations about what you want to achieve in your organization and you go, well, I, I just don't have the the reach for it or the budget for it or the, you know, whatever it is. And I think we're all in that situation and the conversation then quickly pivots to, well, what would it take for us to get that budget? You know, what would it take for us to eventually do it? And then all of a sudden we, you know, to your question earlier, about how do you prioritize these things? It's like, okay, well, we know that's where we want to be. Um, so how do we get there? Oh, well, this stakeholder really wants to see the, the, you know, the bottom line on this type of experience. They want to know that, you know, people like it or not, people are taking it and people are engaged with it. <laughs> yeah. um, and then, you know, and then you're building onto that concept, like, okay, great. And as they're taking it and thing, is there a component where maybe we can learn more about their needs and what they're trying to do? And maybe we can have a group of that. And so you're kind of building on it. And all of a sudden you're starting with something very small and tactical and focused that, you know, can be executed in the next three to six months or something like that. Um, but you're building towards that dream that that key stakeholder you're working with has and saying, let's get that win so that you can get that bigger win down the road. Yeah, put, putting yourself in their shoes, right? Having a bit of an empathetic approach so you can sort of target what they're, they're looking for, I think is really effective. Um, do, you, do you have any secret sauce around training budgets and, and sort of uh, re requests for, 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 more, for more budget and all, all the good stuff? The secret sauce is don't go to training for the budget. I would say, <laughs> yeah. um, it's, uh, well, I mean, I, I, I'm saying that with a, with a smile on my face, but there is a certain truth in it in the sense of, um, and, and it's, it's actually a great indicator of how an organization is set up as well, too, in terms of how an organization is dedicated to what they consider to be an L and D budget or, you know, a performance mm. budget or whatever that may be. Um, but, you know, um, having worked in all sorts of fields, you know, whether it's, you know, sales training, leadership training, uh, diversity. So where it's coming, where the budget is coming from is a good indicator of also the priority within the business. And so sometimes, uh, you know, you've got a budget to work with and it is what it is and you've got to find success within it. But sometimes also you're working in partnership with your stakeholder to say, um, how can we how can you, how can we partner within the business to maybe extend it further, knowing that we're all touching on the same metrics and touching on the same uh, things that are going to get impact. And where I've often found success is being able to have that conversation with that business leader in a different unit and talk about the vision that we are trying to accomplish and then saying, are you on board or not? And very rarely do you get an answer along the lines of, oh, well, this is an L&D initiative. And so, uh, you know, as you were, but yeah. rather more of like, okay, I'm excited about this. You know, how can, yeah. how can I contribute to it as well too? So sometimes, you know, you just need to do a little bit more of the legwork ahead of time to get partnership within the business because, you know, there's, there's always benefits to being on in-house in an organization. There's always benefits to being on the, the vendor client side. And I would say probably one of the, the, the great benefits of being on the client vendor side is that sometimes you just get to be that third person looking into a room and asking those questions that might stimulate conversation or bring out that elephant in the room and help help that organization just speak to each other more. 
and get galvanized around a project or an initiative in a way that maybe they just didn't feel like they could. You know, I, I'm, a, I'm a strong, I'm a strong pro proponent of like, we're just in a human business. We're just in the business of whether we're creating things together or we're, you know, trying to help our end group. It's all just human contact. It's human relationships. Um, and so just the most fun I've also had, I would say, you know, in, in working in different projects and clients is, are the ones where it's like, let's get some energy and excitement around this initiative and let's bring the whole business on board with us to do it. And yeah, and they certainly lead to stronger budgets as well too. But usually if uh, it starts and ends with the training budget, it means that I haven't done my job in terms of, uh, you know, uh, uncovering more, or um, I haven't helped my key stakeholder look towards their business to try and see where else can they get help. Yeah, absolutely. I, I love what you said about L&D sort of just facilitating the conversation and and, and yeah. sort of poking and prodding for some of that um, that underlying sort of goal where you can go, oh, yes, we can target that. Oh, we do need to do this or that. And, and that will have an impact. I think that those things um, sometimes get a little bit lost in L&D. And, you know, when you're focusing on compliance and completion rates, you can you can definitely understand why. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, we're and we're all just here to solve the problem. Right. Um, you know, I say problem. It also could be an opportunity, but it's also just, you know, that's l and is just one of the levers. And, and that's why, you know, I strongly believe that at that that key business table or whatever it is, you should bring as many people as possible because everyone's got a unique perspective on that challenge, right? Everyone's got a really unique perspective on, um, you know, IT can solve a certain problem if, if you, you, you gave it enough focus uh, in a certain way around what it's trying to do, right? So, um, and from, you know, the, the CEO's perspective, that's actually the most efficient use of your budget is that, you know, there's no waste there because you found the right the best way to understand the problem before you dive into solving it. And I think that L and D budgets kind of trickle down the path of like, Oh, we're, we're presuming we know the solution and the solution is training uh, or the solution is technology to put forward the training. And it's only one of those two things. And there's nothing else that L and D can contribute to the organization, which we of course know is not true. Right. So. Yeah, absolutely. And, and once you've, I guess, got your budget and, and, and got a bit of a strategy around it, have you gone about educating or sort of aligning um, people leaders across the business? So obviously in a large organization, you might not have time to go and talk with the, you know, every single people leader or, or supervisor and manager, but how would you sort of do that, that process on mass that you've described a little bit earlier around sort of engaging those stakeholders and whatnot? Have you seen that done, done well anywhere? Yeah. You know, I, I think it's a little bit of, of, of drink your own Kool-Aid, you know, it's uh <laughs> Do you, is that a reference that makes sense outside of North America? Yeah, Kool-Aid? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, I don't remember the last time I drank Kool-Aid, but anyway, yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, I, I mean, my, my career has always sort of been crafted around immersive, um, engaging experiences and whatever we need to do to capture hearts and minds of our audiences. And so bringing in elements of film and marketing and advertising, um, anything to get people excited about something uh, that's always what I found is just the most persuasive, persuasive way to convince anyone in anything. So why wouldn't we use that for our own internal stakeholders? Right. So there is this, this is, you know, a, a good example of, you know, working towards that bigger dream that you have within, you know, the organization, we ran a great pilot and it actually, there was some amazing stories in there. Um, but we also knew that in this organization that was like globally dispersed in 50,000 people, we also knew that this was probably not going to make it beyond their SharePoint site or whatever it is. And so we actually put aside a little bit of budget to create a trailer around it, a trailer around the pilot itself. And we brought in audience testimonials. We spoke a little bit to the design. And of course we ended with the metrics and what we tried to do. And we just made it this amazing best practice lesson learned, threw it onto the social channels. And we didn't say much about it. And, and we just said here, this is some amazing thing we did, but the way it was packaged the way we told the story around it created so much buzz within the organization that that individual ended up getting so much more response and engagement from other parts of the business. Be like, Hey, can you do what you did except do it in this region for us? Or can you do that except for this, you know? And so this concept of making something go viral within your organization, it's not just for your learners. It's a, everyone's moving in the same direction within an organization of, we know where the strategy is. We know how we need to do it. And here's L and D's role in helping to execute that. And, it, what I find it particularly exciting about it 
coming back to everyone's got their own notion of what learning is or, you know, what it can be. It just helps redefine and raise the bar for what training learning can be within an organization and go, oh, I didn't know you guys were capable of that. Or that's really cool. It's like, oh, I didn't know that was learning. Well, what is learning, you know? And it's, uh, and, and so just finding a way to package that, tell the story, give it a little bit of a polished look. Um, and of course, that's a little bit of an investment as well too. But if you've got a large complex organization, it's such an amazing way to cut through the noise and say, look at this amazing thing that we've been working on that you just didn't know about yet. Yeah, absolutely. I love that putting a little bit of budget aside to run sort of a bit of a trailer for it. I think that's really cool. And and, and probably something that's a little bit different too, that most L&D teams probably don't get the the chance to experience. So it's a bit of fun. So, um, you know, it always keeps things. Yeah, and, and, and of, of course, if you're also like trying to spread the word about, you know, coming back to compliance training, if trying to spread the word about nudging people to say, hey, you should probably take this exciting training. It also creates this amazing sense of FOMO, right? Of like, oh, okay, <laughs> well, this sounds kind of cool. When's it coming to my neck of the woods, you know? And so it's... Uh, that buzz, that excitement, like any good trailer, it just leaves you wanting more. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's really that's a really cool idea. I, I really like that 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 approach. Um, on, on a bit of a different note, uh, do you ever or have you seen much success with organizations mapping their um, training to capabilities and and skills within the organization? Is that something that you've sort of seen as one of those data points that we, we sort of touched on earlier? Yeah, this is this is such a great and timely question. Um, and and how can you not speak about it in terms of relevance to technology as well, too, right? Yeah. So, as as a digital learning advisor, that's usually one of the key questions I get up front. Certainly from the stakeholders, like, but can we map these pathways, these activities, to our capability framework? Um, that is one of the most critical ones. And you know, there's a lot of really great, sophisticated technology that help us do it. Um, and and I think my sort of answer to it is coming back to experiences and environments um, and not about technology and capability frameworks, you know, and all that kind of stuff, which is all very important, but it, it is a little bit of cart before the horse. Um, talking about what is an environment that helps people grow their careers and do things that are relevant to what is required of them, but also what is interesting to them in order to do it. Uh, and we, of course, we know in the world of curation and AI that allows us to map these things a certain way. Think about what the end experience of that might be. So an example of that might be, oh, well, we, we, can, we can map 5,000 things to this one capability for you. Is that what learners are looking for? <laughs> you know, um, and, and so just having a really great sense of what and every organization is different, right? And it's like understanding how your organization ticks in terms of how they receive it. Because if you just flaunt the technology and say, the, now you'll have unprecedented access to all the things tied to leadership <laughs> and giving yeah. feedback. And you know, and I always think from a learner's standpoint, it's like, I don't have 20 minutes to dedicate to you know writing my own emails and you expect me to go through 50 TED Talks, three LinkedIn courses, and you know all of that. So- all of it is great, but it just needs to be used with precision. Yeah. You know, and it just, it needs to be having content is great. And I've been in the content business for a long time, but having context is much better. And understanding your learner's context is just paramount so that you can put maybe one or two things in front of them a week. Yeah. And that nudge, that recommendation is so powerful that you have a much higher chance of them taking it or even better yet, learning something from it, not just consuming it um, and bringing that into their next conversation, whether it's with their you know, manager or whether it's in a job shadowing opportunity or something like that to bring it into it. So I'm all on board with the capabilities and technology partnership. We just need to make sure not to flood our learners with it just because we're excited about it. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I really like what you said about context being more important than content, because I think that's um, the context of it means that they relate, right? As opposed to there's, and like you said, there might be tens of thousands of training opportunities for something like leadership. I'm sure there's probably millions out there. Um, but if the context is completely different, it's hard for them to identify and, and get excited about that that piece of content. Yeah. And, and, and this especially becomes important, like when you bring things closer to like in the flow of work, right? It's, uh, you might be, you might identify that, like, you know, and there might have been an assessment, or you might have gone through a, a much bigger training uh, at some point, you might say, hey, 
a big pain point of our organization is giving feedback as an example. And I think the tempting side to say is, well, let's assemble our armies of course libraries together and give them everything possible on feedback. When really maybe that person, a well-timed X, I don't even want to call it a course, but a well-timed whatever, maybe 10 minutes before that Thursday afternoon one-on-one -on -one they have with someone where they know they're struggling to give feedback, using five minutes in a really well-executed, focused way and you know, getting the context right is going to be 10 times more important than saying, oh, well, we we'll put you on a learning journey for giving feedback. It's going to take you about five hours to complete. Uh, and it's a, you know, it's a basics course, but there should be stuff in there and you need to go and sift and find the stuff there. It's like, no, find within that capability framework, within that skills framework, find the specific thing that I'm looking for as a learner. Maybe I'm having trouble giving feedback about poor performance uh, in a tech skills environment or something like that. Okay, maybe we need to pair someone up with that in terms of a mentor, or maybe we have enough of a challenge as an organization with that one specific thing, it might invest, it might make sense for us to invest in a little chunk of a one minute video or something like that, or, you know, yeah. and that's the, that's the business problems, the business decisions we make around, okay, well, if we can improve the context to improve the content, what's the payoff for that? And, and kind of just to, to, you know, tie a bow around what we asked in the beginning was, you know, What's the most meaningful use of technology? That's a really great example of like, well, we've got, I've got all my, I've got all my course libraries here, Josh, and I've got my two LXB LMSs over here, Josh, and I've got a bunch of learners that seem to be disengaged. And I've got some stakeholders that think they know what these people need. Now solve for X, you yeah. know, and then the, the, and the tempting part is to be like, okay, well, let's just merge these libraries, build this sophisticated capability framework on our platform and just learning journeys go. Not necessarily a bad idea, but is it the most efficiently executed idea? That's, and that's where we need to come back and ask those simple questions of like, let's bring our learners into this. Yeah. What are you looking for? What are you trying to, well, if you had a perfect technology solution, what would that technology solution do for you? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I feel like it's very easy to overwhelm people these days because the, the sort of the go-to for most of the uh, content or learning uh, sort of tech stacks is we have X amount of things and it's like, well, but what does that mean? And, and is that super effective? And it's great. It is great to, ha to have all of those options, but sometimes you're overwhelmed with options. Um, are you are you a big proponent, I guess, of of sort of like guided learning then over sort of a fully self directed type of approach? You know, it's it's funny. My my entire bias comes from the self directed world. Yeah. Um, that's that's really uh, where I've spent a good chunk of of my time developing self directed experiences. And so, uh, anytime you have guided or synchronous experiences like that, I always look at it from a self-directed lens of like, oh, okay, this is a, an interesting way to bring it because I've always had the design challenge of saying, nope, just you versus the computer go, you know, yeah. which is, which is an interesting way in also to just get engagement, you know, think about the emotional side of learning. You think about that a lot more in self-directed because you realize just how isolating it can be compared yeah. to social components or, or guided learning is that, you know, but I, you know, I, I have a hard time answering questions like this because learning is so nuanced that it needs to include everything. Yes. It needs to include the informal learning, the social learning. It needs to have, it needs to, it needs to have components of self-directed. It needs to have components of, um, you know, uh, live synchronous in-person digital. It needs to have all of those things. Uh, and I think anyone that pretends that one is the better than the other just hasn't sat and saw how people learn, you know, because we all learn in different ways. Uh, and I'm not going to talk about learning styles or anything like that, but we all, <laughs> we all work in, in, we all learn in different ways, uh, which is really exciting yeah. uh, because I think, you know, in, in the old days, we weren't allowed to learn in different ways, yeah. you know, and if, you know, you grew up in sort of the college university system, it's like, no, show up, go to the lecture, do the reading, go to the exam and it's done. And it's like, it doesn't have to be that way. And that actually makes it super exciting. Yes. Uh, and going on that journey with organizations and partners to understand what makes your organization tick the best is that's one of the most reward, rewarding parts of the job, if you ask me. Yeah, absolutely. That's such a good way to frame it, I think. Um, and yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. I wish the traditional institutions sort of embrace some of these 
uh, principles that I think like corporate and government sort of organizations are starting to embrace and, and bring to the table as well. And it doesn't necessarily have to be listen to 20 lectures and then we're going to grill you in a room for a bit and, and, and you're on your way. Um, my, my sort of my, my last question is uh, if anyone's really interested in getting in touch with you, where can they find you? Yeah. So I, two things I would say, uh, one is, uh, if you, if you like my flavor of sarcasm and wit, uh, I highly recommend you check out Digital Learning Done Right. It's just a short little audio series, uh, short episodes, a lot of pop culture references that talk about actually a lot of the things we spoke about today. So uh, definitely think that would be something of interest. And then the other part of it is uh, come find me on LinkedIn um, and uh, we can uh, connect. Don't shy away from reaching out and uh, love grabbing coffees with everyone and learning more about people's world. So yeah, don't shy away and just, you can find me directly on LinkedIn. Yeah, great. Well, thank you so much for, for spending some time with me and, and having a bit of a chat. I think it was a, a really interesting one and uh, we covered some some pretty cool and, and different ground to some of the other, other combos that I've had so far. So I really, really appreciate it. I'm Blake Provitz and you're watching the Strategic L&D Podcast. If you want to stay up to date with our latest releases, subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you just want the audio, you'll find us on most common podcast platforms, including Spotify and Apple. Enjoy the rest of your day and we'll see you again soon.